spirit, key, and the multitude, a comparative theology for the democracy of creation. Author, Hoyle Dong Lee. Comparative theology, thinking across traditions. Category, religion, theology, and Asian studies. Spirit Key and the Multitude, a Comparative Theology for the Democracy of Creation. Back Cover Book Report. Back Cover is as follows. This is a highly creative, original, powerfully expressed, and deeply researched book. Robert Neville, Boston University. This is a very original and substantive contribution to Whiteheadian process theology. Comparative theology, Neo-Confucian studies, and Asian theology. Remarkable for the sheer number of sources synthesized. The thoroughness with which Systematic ontological questions are raised and analyzed, and the consistency of commitment to postmodern values with which the sources are critiqued and retrieved. Anselm K. Claremont Graduate University Rippling between East and West, between the energizing depths of mysticism and the democracy of the restless multitude, this text foments an unprecedented coalescence of political and comparative theology. Catherine Keller, Drew University Spirit Key and the Multitude is a fascinating and captive or creative study, rather, in comparative philosophy and theology that achieves two major objectives with flair and insight. The first accomplishment in Lee's creation of an extended dialogue between the Western process, philosophical, and theological tradition inspired by Whitehead with a series of the most innovative Korean Neo-Confucian philosophers. This is a complex and fluent work in parentheses for serious researchers only. Perhaps if you're looking for simplicity, this work is not for you. Continuing, this work will uh, stimulate and intrigue comparative philosophers, theologians, and students of Asian Confucianism. Indeed, a rare achievement on all levels of scholarly dialogue, dialogical intricacy, many scholars have sensed the compatibility of Whiteheadian process thought with Korean Neo-Confucianism and in spirit, key, and the multitude, both sides of the comparative equation are encouraged to talk intelligently and successfully to each other. We live in an increasingly global, interconnected, and interdependent world in which various forms of systematic imbalance in power have given birth to a growing demand for a genuine pluralism and democracy. As befits a world so interconnected, this book presents a comparative theological and philosophical attempt to construct new underpinnings for the idea of democracy 
by bringing the Western concept of spirit into dialogue with the East Asian non-dualistic and non-hierarchical notion of qi, often called qi or ji in the West. The book follows the historical adventures of the idea of qi through some of its Confucian and Taoist textual histories in East Asia, mainly Lao Tzu, Zhu Zi, and if my pronunciation is wrong, forgive me, Taigil, Nan Gun Moon, and Su An, and compares them with analogous conceptualizations of the ultimate creative and spiritual power found in the intellectual constellations of Western and or Christian thought, namely Whitehead's creativity, Hegel's Geist or Ghost, Deleuze's Chaosmos, and Catherine Keller's Taeom. Hayu Dong Li is assistant professor of comparative theology at Drew University School of Theology. Now to read a bit of the internal makeup of the text from the prologue <clears throat> to give you an idea. A meeting of two stories. One evening in the spring of 1897 in Korea, in a tiny village of peasants southeast of what is now Seoul, the capital city, a small group of people gathered in a house, a thatched hut to perform the customary Confucian ritual of honoring the ancestors. When the food and drink offerings were set up on a table to face the wall where the spirits of the ancestors were supposed to take a seat, the spiritual leader of the group, 71-year-old Cho Si Xiong, whose horrific, or honorific rather, name was Hewal, asked the group to reverse the table set up from now on. When you perform the ritual, set up the offerings to face yourselves. The story of ultimate energy in Eastern learning. For centuries, if not millennia, the food and drink offerings in the ritual of the ancestor veneration had always been made to the higher spiritual powers for their enjoyment, not for the people who served them up. When the people helped themselves to the offering, it was always after they were graciously invited by the spiritual powers to participate in the enjoyment, the invitation being the sign of the pleasure and willingness of the spiritual powers to bless the good folk who had just proven their devotion and loyalty. Such a structure of worshipping and honoring higher spiritual powers seems to be fairly universal, historically speaking. We can discern it from the setup of temples and altars or the sequence of worships of and rituals across cultures and religions. It is therefore hard to miss the fact that there was a potent symbolism involved in Hailwall's act of reversing or turning upside down what was almost universally accepted way of relating to higher spiritual powers. The symbolism becomes even more potent when we understand the timing of Hewal's instruction as indicated by the way his words began, from now on. When was the now? Hewal gave the speech three years after the first revolutionary attempt at establishing a government of the people, by the people, for the people in Korea was defeated by an imperial 
colonial power. In 1894, a largely peasant revolutionary army of 100,000, armed mostly with spears and matchlock muskets, marched to the capital city, or marched rather, to the capital city of Seoul. At the strategically critical mountain pass of Yugumanchi, Yugo, it was met by the combined forces of the Imperial Japanese Army and the client Korean government troops, well entrenched in their defensive positions and armed with artillery, Gatling guns, and modern high-powered rifles. There, after four days of bloody battle, their dream of a new world, a new era, died, together with the short-lived democratic self-government, which they had established in the most populous southwestern province under their control. Hawal was the spiritual leader who had inspired the dream, while being reluctant to use force to achieve it. Now on the run and in hiding, in what was probably the darkest hour for himself and his followers, in fact, with only a year left before he was to be captured, tried, and executed, Hawa taught his last teaching, which many in the West or North Atlantic world might misinterpret as a secular humanistic disavowal of higher spiritual powers, but which was in fact the spiritual climax and culmination of the revolutionary dream of his and his followers. To explain what I mean, we need to go back 37 years earlier to the year 1860. In that year, the British and French expeditionary forces captured Beijing, the capital of the neighboring Chinese Empire, after a series of brutal campaigns and burned down the summer palace of the emperor, the son of heaven, it was an event with earth-shaking repercussions in Korea as China's model client state within the old imperial order. The British and the French, together with their U.S. and Russian allies, forced various humiliating territorial and trade concessions upon the Chinese Qing or Queen, Qing dynasty, with spelled with a Q, including significantly unimpeded Christian missionary activities at a time where, when all of southern China was wrested from the king control under the Taiping Rebellion, the leader of which was a product of Christian missionary activities. The supreme leader of that colossal and bloody struggle a heterodox Christian convert named Hong Shkwan called himself a son of God and the younger brother of Jesus and saw it as his God-given mandate to restore China to the forgotten classical Confucian worship of the Lord on high. whom he identified with the Christian God by setting up an apocalyptic heavenly kingdom of great peace. In the other neighboring nation, Japan, the gunboat diplomacy of the United States had forced open its doors to the West several years earlier and helped it begin a process of rapid modernizing, enlightening transformation in the fashion of the European Enlightenment, which was to enable Japan to escape Asia and to join the ranks of the modern imperial powers. Japan was soon to copycat at the Korean port of Ishian, and these same tactics taught it by the U.S. Navy, forcing its way into the heart of the Korean Peninsula as the first act of its eventually successful colonizing project. 
Within Korea, the 500-year-old rule of the Confucian literary of the Joseon dynasty called Young Ban had exhausted the socially and culturally reforming impulses of its beginning and was losing its once firm grip on the people and their everyday way of life. As it faced the widespread corruption in the government and the repeated revolt of the exploited mass of peasants, Roman Catholic Christianity had reached the Korean shores many decades earlier and was spreading its revolutionary message of the equality of all people, men and women, aristocrats and peasants, Koreans and barbarian foreigners before one God called Lord of Heaven. Yet, its Vatican-directed condemnation of traditional Confucian rituals and customs, such as the ancestor veneration as pagan idolatry and its repeated appeal to the intervention of the European imperial powers together put on Catholic Christianity, an indelible stamp of being an alien threat leading to brutal persecutions that drove it underground. In such a time of external and internal crisis, in a remote village located in the southeastern corner of Korea, someone heard a divine voice. That person was Cho Jehu, 1824 to 1864 CE, whose honorific name was Suan, Suan was Heol's teacher and spiritual predecessor. He was an ex-Confucian scholar born into the ruling class of Confucian literary, but whose once illustration illustrious family line had fallen to the nadir of poverty and marginalization in his generation, forced into what was the degrading occupation of trading in everyday items such as cotton cloth, he had traveled all over the country and witnessed the suffering of people in a highly tumultuous, confusing, and oppressive time. Under the looming threat of foreign imperial powers and the corrupt and tyrannical hands of the ruling elites, to find an answer to the spiritual and social ills of his time, Su Un had returned to his hometown secluded himself in a mountain cave, a Buddhist place of retreat, and started to pray fervently to the highest spiritual power yet unknown to him. After a year of spiritual wrestling, praying for 49 days at a time like a devout Buddhist, he finally had a life-changing encounter with Lord Heaven, translated, of course, into English, a, a name that is difficult to pronounce, so I will just use Lord Heaven, continuing, whose teaching he initially thought was the Christian teaching, only to be immediately corrected by Lord Heaven in the wake of that encounter, Su'un started to proclaim a new teaching, that is, a new way, which promised a new age of peace and harmony, and which he claimed to encompass the traditional teachings of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Sianando, the Korean form of Taoism. He named the new teaching Dong Hok or Eastern Learning. In a self-conscious attempt at providing a revolutionary yet non-alien indigenous alternative to what he considered was the inadequate, if not entirely false, teachings of Western learning, or Christianity, Su'un's new teaching consisted in a simple truth. All of us were bearers of Lord Heaven. The core tenet of his teaching that enabled him to make that claim was the notion 
of qi or qi or qi, which is part of the commonly shared cosmology among East Northeastern Asian cultures even today, and which I translate here as psychological energy. Psychological energy has two modalities, receptive and active, yin and yang, whose dynamic combination and constant turning into each other constitute the creative, transformative processes of the universe that give birth to all things, all things. In this worldview, there is nothing that is not psychophysical energy. I believe I said psychological energy before. It's psychophysical energy. Pardon me. Continuing. For that energy is both mind and body, ideal and material, and spiritual and natural. Sun Un made this notion, the psychophysical energy, the pivotal connecting link between Lord Heaven and human beings. When he went a step further to speak of Lord Heaven or ultimate energy, by ultimate energy, he meant psychophysical energy in its primordial and ultimate form. There are various symbols to express this, depending on which tradition you are viewing. <clears throat> Being mysterious, indescribable, ineffable, beyond existence and non-existence, yet all-encompassing and omnipresent, as the ground of being and becoming, as the dynamic creativity at the root of all things, and as the womb filled with chaotic waters from which the myriad creatures were born. And a lot, a lot of these concepts bring to mind biblical images, probably by design. So Un taught his followers a regimen of bodily and meditational practices to cultivate and rectify their psychophysical energy in the attitude of sincerity, reverence, and trust. And at the core of this practice lay the recitation of a devotional incantation. Ultimate energy being all around me here and now, I pray for its great descent. I bear Lord Heaven and the heavenly work of creative becoming is being established in me. If I never forget the heavenly presence within, I will know all things. By earnestly desiring and praying to be united with the ultimate energy, people could be Become aware of the ultimate connection between their own psychophysical energy and the ultimate energy or source or what Western theologians call God because the ultimate energy within them would speak to them as a personal deity as Lord Heaven. and tell them the following earth-shaking truth. My heart and mind is no other than your heart and mind. Humanity is heaven. This short sentence became the principal motto of the Dong Hak movement. When one of his disciples asked a question about the difference between his teachings and the Western learning of Christianity, 
Su Un's answer was telling because it encapsulated the challenge which is Eastern learning through, through down to Christianity and the entire Western or North Atlantic civilization whose imperial aggression was seen by him to be spearheaded by Christianity. Christians or Westerners, he remarked, did not have in their bodies the spirit of the harmonious becoming of psycho-physical energy. He explained what he meant as follows. Western learning or Christianity lacked an understanding of the vital and intimate connection between Lord Heaven and the whole of humanity, between human beings and between human and non-human creatures. As a result, Western learning excelled in the production of inauspicious death-dealing technologies and violent instruments of domination, as proven by the formidable armaments of the Western imperial powers, while promoting the selfish pursuit of individual salvation from this oppressive world by imagining a heavenly world where Lord Heaven was believed to dwell and to which people needed to go after death in order to be saved. Skipping forward to the final paragraph of this section because I don't want to read too much from uh, this copyrighted material, but just to give you enough so that you can taste and see that comparative theology is good. Continuing to the last paragraph of this particular section, uh, Su Un's notion of ultimate energy as Lord Heaven and vice versa, which I argue represents his subversive and resistant rewriting of the pivotal cosmological concept of psychophysical energy in the hegemonic. hegemonic East Asian traditions of Confucianism and Taoism thus throws down the gauntlet to Christianity. One which is not necessarily the objective of this book, but just to show you the historical uh, commingling, if you will, of East and West traditions and how far back it actually goes and what they thought of one another, perhaps. Uh, continuing, thus throws down the gauntlet to Christianity, which has always claimed to be empowered, driven, and guided by the Holy Spirit proceeding from God the Father, who is the Lord and King of the universe. Yet the biblical testimonies declare that God is spirit, whom we need to worship in spirit and truth. John 4, 24, that we are boldly temples of God's spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and that the spirit of God dwells within us in Christ is the sign of our adoption as heirs of the new world, the reign of God in which the whole creation will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God, Romans 8, 9-17. In declaring us to be bearers of the Spirit, the biblical testimony seem to point to a connecting link, that is, a meditation by Spirit between God and creatures, the holy and the unholy, the noble and the base, in the good news of Jesus Christ, which the Apostle Paul proclaims in the Holy Spirit, then not something analogous to the spirit of the harmonious becoming of psychophysical energy. This book is in a major sense a Christian theological attempt to answer this question in the affirmative, but in order to try to answer 
we need first to tell the story of the Holy Spirit in Christianity more closely. And so it goes the next, the story of the Holy Spirit in Western learning. Is the Holy Spirit then not something analogous to the spirit of the harmonious becoming of psychophysical energy? That is the question that this book attempts to answer. And it answers quite eloquently. Because it gives you the answer within a process, theological, philosophical framework as well. So I would recommend Spirit, Key, and the Multitude, but only if you're serious about comparative theology. A comparative theology for the democracy of creation. Hoi Dong Lee. Thank you for listening.